Ballistic Ribs has become really quite famous over the years for the generation of some serious seagoing boats. Boats that, in fact, that were built to handle the kind of seas you get in South Africa where these boats are built. Now, to this point, it's also been known as quite a traditional builder. Both this WK work line and its LS leisure line, featuring boats from five to eight metres, where they're all quite traditional ribs. Wide diameter tubes, jockey seats, lots of deck space. But here we have the new X. P80 and this is a boat that deviates from that established formula in a lot of quite exciting ways. Now clearly with this hard top and all this inboard furniture, it differs in loads of ways. But one of the most substantial ways it differs is in the arrangement at the transom. So to illustrate that difference, I want to just take a little stroll forward to this ballistic up here. Now this is a shorter boat, that's the 80, this is a 68. But as you can see, it takes a very conventional approach. At the aft end of the hull, you've got the transom. Between the tubes, you've got the uh, outboard engine. And then there's a little engine well ahead of that so you can trim the engine out. That's all pretty conventional, but of course that shifts the accommodation relatively far forward. Well, the new XP80, that takes a very different approach indeed. And it's an approach that really illustrates the difference in terms of application. Because while you might easily suggest that, like uh, perhaps Humber, other brands like that, ballistics like the boat up there kind of take commercial boats and then adapt them for leisure use. Well, this is built for leisure right from the ground up. So look here. Compare this to the other boat, the engine would be right forward here at the back end of the hull. What we have here though on this 7.8 metre hull, it's taken from the same 7.8 metre hull that's used on the WK and the LS lines, is a hull extension. And then we have a full beam swim platform there. We also have low level furniture. So what we're basically doing is extending the day spaces. You can still trim that engine out, but from this point all the way forwards, everything can be given over to leisure use, to day boating entertainment. So that's a major, major difference. And when we look at these platforms, well, it'd be easy to say, well, they're very small, potentially unusable, you might think, but that's not the case. We have a little bracket here so you can slide a removable ladder onto there. And we've got the same on the other side, so you can pick which side you want to use. And if you hang about there, Paul, I'll just go and grab that ladder, ladder which uh, sits inside the console here. There we are. Now this ladder, relatively simplistic, it's got its own dedicated bracket inside that console, but as you can see, we've got a couple of these little knobs that you slot into this guide and pop it down into the water. And the attractive thing about this is the fact that, uh, well, if you drop it overboard, and I hope he's telling me the truth because I'm about to do just that, it ought, oh, there we are, that's a relief, to float. So if you drop it overboard, you can just retrieve it, no trouble at all and pack it back away. So that's an attractive touch. What else I like back here, actually, is the stern furniture. Now, you look at it and you think, well, look here. This is a rib with 460 mil collar. On a rib, that is gonna narrow down the internal beam, and it does so. We've got a beam of eight foot three, I think, on this boat, but the internal beam is actually only about five feet. Then you look back here and you see these big, big mouldings and you think, well, why have they done that? Because they narrow their own beam even a little bit more. But when you sit in here on this half bench, well, that tells you what you need to know. You really sit in it. You're not sitting on it. It feels fantastically safe and secure. I'm jammed here in a corner with really good grabbing points all round. And I face across to a little lift up bench there for two people to face aft. So you can sit four people here, plus there's a space of course on either tube, that's very comfortable, a table in the middle. So this is a dining station for six people. And actually, these mouldings too, they're painted with a kind of gritty sandpaper-like paint, which makes them really grippy even when they're wet. 
And while you might look after and say, well, yeah, that's fine, but these mouldings do hem in this uh, sun pad aft. Well, yeah, it looks ridiculous like this, but a simple adjustment like that gives you a good, well, six foot four, I would say, of sunbathing space. So in all regards, I have to say, the back end of this boat works really well. Now, as I say, this is the first of the XP line. That's the first of the Explorer line. And Ballistic likes to call this the ultimate adventure rib. So, of course, it's got to be able to give you a taste of pretty much every form of waterborne recreation going. And it makes a pretty good fist of it. You can zip off these uh, headrests here and stow those away. You can also lift up these aft sun pad cushions and you've got a proper deck, a proper line deck. So you can come back here and fish unencumbered. We've also got a good sturdy wakeboarding point built into this uh, T-top up there. But undoubtedly my favourite feature in this back end has to be this section here. <laughs> now that's a really heavy lid. Uh, it takes a bit of welly to get it up there. It could definitely do, I think, with some good strong rams to assist you. But of course, they don't want you to have to rely on rams because if a big boat comes past, you don't want the wake to be causing this lid to go up and down while you're inside there and causing you concern. So this strap makes all kinds of sense. And once you've anchored that in place, it's a pretty simple operation. What you have here is a proper double berth. I mean, it's not massive, but neither is it a silly gimmick. I mean, it's a genuinely usable space. If I crawl in here, you can see you've got a good six foot to play with at least. There's plenty of space for two adults to spend the night in here. And yeah, it's only camping rather than proper weekending. But at the same time, the fact you could sleep on board absolutely transforms the usability of this boat. The nav lights are stowed in here and so is a spare table for this cockpit area. And I have to say, these canvases are beautiful quality. They feel really heavy duty, like old school waxed canvases. Lovely stuff that. And actually, while I'm talking about the canvas, it's perfectly possible that it's not available yet, that you'll be able to use canvases to cordon off the front end of this cockpit in the Nordic style so you can go boating when it's freezing, or in fact, cordon off the entire section beneath this T-top for proper communal year-round use. But of course, one other element of this versatility that Ballistic is going for with this new boat, with this new XP line, is, as I say, the fact that you can use it for almost everything. So this big T-top needs to be quite handy in terms of stowing extra gear, your bikes, your kayaks, your stand-up paddleboards. And as luck would have it, we have a stand-up paddleboard right here. Now, I'm not a big fella, or a particularly strong one, or a particularly young one for that matter. So let's see how easy this actually is. Now we've got a proper tube top tread plate. That helps greatly, and we've got rails everywhere. It's a good sort of height too, you're not having to reach too far as a six footer, that's very simple and I reckon you could achieve the same feat if you were five foot four or so. So that is very useful indeed. Now let's get back on board because there's plenty more to look at and consider. Now the first thing is this, the fuel filler, that leads down to a tank directly under this deck and that tank is 225 litres in capacity, which seems relatively small but they're telling me that this boat runs super efficiently, more efficiently in fact than the 68. With this single 300 on the transom they're saying they're burning at cruising speeds around about one litre per nautical mile. So the 225 litre fuel tank actually transpires, that's quite generous, but if you want even more, well it's an Explorer boat, so they'll give you twin 190 litre tanks instead, and that really does boost your range to in excess of 300 nautical miles, assuming their figures are right, and that's even with 20% sitting spare in the tanks. Now, if we move forward a touch, we'll see we've got some very substantial leaning posts here, and we'll talk about those more when we're out on the water and using them. What I really want to talk about in here though, are the position of this helm console and its elevation. Now, it's positioned a long way forward. Again, just like the transom arrangement, that's to maximise cockpit space for day boating use, something that the leisure boats and the work boats absolutely don't do in the established lines. What I also want to mention is the fact that, well, if you're staying on board, it's clear that you need a toilet. In fact, even if you're not staying on board, most people will want access to a toilet 
and we have one here now again the rams are a bit a bit iffy i think we need to beef those up but of course this is boat number one so i'll take the chances and nip in here to show you what it's all about now it's not uh, salubrious in here there's not a lot of space it's pretty simplistic uh, but it does the job. What we have here on this particular boat is a simple porta potty, a portable loo. But there is space apparently beneath this deck for a holding tank. So you could also spec this with a proper sea toilet, which would be a very worthwhile investment. And the finish is not fantastic, but as I say, this is boat number one. And there is a light and there is a handle to help you get back out of the space. So it's perfectly serviceable, both for weekend in use and day boat in use. Now let's pop forward and take a little look at the bow. Now, as I make my way towards this bow, you can see how far forward this console is positioned. I mean, between the leading edge of that console and the forepeak, it's, it's barely even my wingspan. So it really is right up here. Of course, as I say, that's to generate extra space aft, but they've been quite clever with it. They've tapered this console down either side so you can still get a proper walkway. You don't feel impeded in any way. So that's quite a neat trick. I also quite like the effort they've gone to with these little design features on the side, kind of automotive style, picks up that design motif aft as well, and the design of the hardtop. It all blends in very harmoniously. And up here, we don't have much. What we do have is, again, pretty good. We've got the suicide seat. I apologise, I don't know what the modern term is for that these days. And basically, this is a seat where a boater will sit if he's never actually been out on a boat before. Um, but as they go, this is pretty good. Because of that elevated console, we've got a nice lofty backrest. We've also got good braces on both sides, plus a couple of grad handles here, and a useful point there to really brace your feet. So at 30, 35 knots, at moderate speeds or moderate seas, this would be a fun place to sit. Ahead of that, again, we don't have much. We have that uh, kind of monument to ballistics commercial heritage in the form of a nice big chunky Samson post and we have the anchor locker under here with a little seat on top of it so one man can sit here and face aft. We've been out on a walk for a couple of hours now having to play. We've had a lot of fun with it, but before we show you what it's actually like to drive, I just want to talk about the uh, seating arrangement. Now, as I say, it's pretty versatile from a uh, day boat in perspective, particularly by the standards of a rib, but it's also really secure. This bench back here, really great place to sit, really safe, and actually surprisingly well sheltered underway. Further forward, a lot of people like to stand and brace themselves against, uh, against impacts with their legs. And this is an equally good place to stand here. But if you have kids and you want to fold up this forward bench, then according to Ballistic, they love to kneel here. So they can hold onto a bar, one on either side, kneel on this bench, look at what you're doing up at the helm and you can keep an eye on them too. So that's really nice. Now these leaning posts, they're obviously fixed. They got little braces on both sides to keep you in place. And there's a six foot where everything falls very nicely to hand. But there's no adjustability either in the wheel or the seats. So it'd be worth investigating the options there. But what I also like about this leaning post though, is that as standard, you've got a cool box under there to uh, keep your drinks in. Decent bit of storage inside there as well. Now, at the helm itself, it's very clear that simplicity is the order of the day. What have we got? We've got two 12 inch chart plotters, we've got a wheel and a throttle, we've got a VHF there and a couple of switches. That's literally it. No compass on top, no nothing. But that's what they were going for. You know, the fusion stereo is operated remotely from the aft bench. So that makes a bit of sense in terms of 
your day out. And up here, there's nothing really to distract you from the job of driving the boat. So that is what we'll do right now. Let me stick the kill cord on. Now, as I say, we've had a little play this morning. So I know that that F300 delivers a pretty impressive fistful of poke. And I'll try to illustrate that right now. Now she's planing in about three seconds flat. Passing 20 knots in six seconds, 30 knots in 10, 40 knots in about 16 seconds. So that, right from the start, illustrates the kind of fun you have at your disposal under your left hand. Now the top end on this boat is round about 47 knots today and that's quite interesting they're anticipating 49 knots perhaps easing towards 50 knots but because we've got that uh, pedal board up on the roof that seems to have a fundamental impact it actually washes a couple of knots off just because of the drag it creates. But this is still a very sporting boat and it feels all the more sporting when you start to throw them around a little bit. We trim her in a touch and we'll turn to starboard first. Now you see there's lots of heel. You lie down on that starboard tube, so much stability. And as you're doing so, I can tighten it and I can throttle on and there's more grip and there's more heel. That's an absolute treat. Uh, we'll do the same to port now. Riding across the elements again. You lean right over. You feel that tube just nestling down there. I mean, there's so much wild hill with this hole. It feels almost as though you capsized the thing if you didn't have those tubes stabilising the ride. But it's very settled. And like I say, you can stick with that across the seas, lots of grip, or you can tighten it and you can throttle a lot and you can really drive it like a little bit of a hooligan and it behaves well for you, it really does. It flatters you as a skipper, flatters you as a helmsman. And what's also interesting is the fact that when we're running along nice and slowly, if I just come down a little off the plane, and let these little swells, this little bit of chop we got running in on us, just come and nestle against the side of the tubes there. And I put a bit of power down as well, give them a little bit of impact. Whether we're doing this kind of pace or we're going faster, well these strakes, we've got twin strakes down the uh, sides of these tubes, and they actually point quite aggressively downwards, and it really does throw that spray down and wide. Nothing has made its way inboard today, as you can see, and that's despite having some quite aggressive little bits of chop coming in on the beam and a pretty stern wind, which I think is getting up to sort of 15, 16 knots. So that's impressive too. Now, let's see if we can get a ride up to the maximum and have a think about how she rides there. So we'll go across the swells again. There you go, we're picking up very nicely. She doesn't need too much trim, but if you decide to give her a fair fistful, she handles it well, she doesn't become uncertain or skittish. There's no rocking and rolling. And the ride is pretty good as well. And she rides quite flat, I would say, but such is the poke from that F300 that you can just spurt the nose up with a bit of power. So while she feels very comfortable as kind of a, a head sea boat, I reckon she'd do pretty well picking a path for a following sea too. They were talking about a litre per nautical mile, which to me seems a bit optimistic. And in practice, that proves to be exactly the case. Now, 
we're up to about 23 knots now with a decent bit of trim and what we're seeing is 40, 40 litres per hour so closer to 2 litres per nautical mile than 1 there is a bit of a sweet spot I notice at round about 30 knots get them up to that pace and you see around about 45 litres per hour so around about 1.5 litres per nautical mile but that is about the best we get so as I say given that the base tank is relatively compact I think the fact that this is an explorer's boat, an adventure boat, that warrants you investing in a pair of those 190 litre fuel tanks just to extend your range and to reduce your dependency on shoreside systems. Quite a uh, charming quirk of this boat um, is a consequence of this helm, both in terms of its position and its shape. Now because the helm console is positioned a long way forward and it's quite lofty, then when you're standing here perched up against your leaning post, you can't actually see the bow of your own boat. And if you get right up there, you can just about see the fore peak, but in a regular stance, what you actually see is just the top end of that Samson post as a marker for where your bow is. And that's quite a charming thing, as I say, it kind of reminds you of when you first started boating in tiny boats and you basically sat up there in the fore peak. It's quite a nostalgic kind of sensation, I enjoy it. And another thing, of course, with this boat is the fact that even though this F300 delivers loads of poke, plus a 48 knot top end, there are options. You can spec it with a pair of 200s for around about 54 knots, which of course pretty much doubles the weight. Or you can spec it, believe it or not, with an XTO 450. Now again, that adds about 200 kilos to the transom weight. Uh, and although that might be exciting for some, well, I just don't see the point, to be honest with you. All that extra weight, plus a lot of extra noise, a lot of extra expense. And this boat just doesn't need it. It's already the best part of a 50 knot boat and it handles exactly as you would have it. So I would suggest that for most people, in fact, pretty much all people, the boat in this format with that engine on the transom is the boat you probably want to buy. Well, that was a lot of fun. That's a fantastic boat to drive. But of course, the driving experience is only part of the story with this boat because the XP80, as I pointed out, is designed to be super versatile and it pretty much delivers on that too. You can sleep on it. You can dine on it. You can sunbathe on it. With this hard top, you can shelter beneath it. You can store gear on top of it. And it's pretty well set up for water sports too. In fact, pretty much the only thing you can't do with this test boat is cook on it. Now, they tried to claim, as I say, that this is the ultimate adventure rib. And in a world of proper, proven offshore pilot house ribs, that, of course, is not the case. That's a claim too far. But with this unique approach, with its traditional rib approach to the underpinnings, and with its entirely non-traditional approach to the sports boat style internals, this boat you see here is about as versatile and enjoyable as any rib of this size and price on the current market.